Hi there, and welcome back to the Beyond Aromatics podcast. I'm your host, Savannah Rose. On today's episode, we sit down with renowned conservation biologist and aromatherapy educator, Dr. Kelly Ablard, and discuss two strongly correlated topics, the conservation of plant species and its impact on aromatherapy in the essential oil market. Dr. Kelly Ablard, founder and executive director of the Aramid Institute, is a conservation biologist and clinical aromatherapist dedicated to the global education, research, and sustainable management of medicinal and aromatic plants. Dr. Ablard is a global presenter and has authored peer-reviewed research in the fields of conservation, sustainability, genetics, chemical ecology, behavior ecology, evolutionary biology, and ethnobotany. She currently conducts research in Peru with the Shipibo and Quechua indigenous peoples into their threatened medicinal and aromatic plants. Kelly also enjoys her role as co-owner and co-principal of Essence of Time College of Holistic Studies. You can learn more about Kelly and the work she does with the Aramid Institute at the following links below on whatever platform you are listening to this podcast on. To learn more about Naha, visit naha.org. If you would like to find out more about our upcoming live stream conference and how you can purchase tickets for a lifetime access to the presentations, please visit conference.naha.org. All right, enjoy the show. So today I have on Kelly Blard. Um, Hi, Kelly. How are you doing? I'm fine, Savannah. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. And, um, Kelly, tell us where you're uh, speaking to us from. Well, right now I am coming to you from Little Snoring in England, <laughs> which is about uh, two and a half hours northeast of London, not too far from the coast. Nice. Yeah. And um, so today, you know, we just spoke with Gabriel and we had kind of hinted at maybe doing a <laughs> recording of you and we were so excited Um to get you on because not only are you going to be um, speaking at the conference this year, but um, you've also just got a ton of work going on in sustainability of wild um, plants. And I just think that's such a big topic, especially to talk about today. And uh, it's very, just it goes so much deeper within the field of aromatherapy in general. And um, getting to see this aspect of it, I think is just really important. And mm-hmm. you're also speaking at our conference this year. Yeah, I'm really excited. So uh, first of all, I, I just want to thank you, Savannah, and thank Naha, um, the board, for giving me the opportunity to, to be here today and, and also the opportunity to you know, share a really important, which I feel is a very important topic um, at the conference this year. So yes, it's uh, all in the vein of sustainability, which I agree is a really important aspect of aromatherapy, especially as we're evolving as a community uh, quite rapidly. Um, and that's more or less, you know, looking at a, a pretty heavy demand being placed on the essential oils um, at a pretty alarming rate if we're thinking about what we're, we're looking at in terms of cost. Um, but we can talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so I think this is um, a really important subject in, in our field. And I'm finding that it's becoming more and more um, prevalent, uh, more of a transparent conversation, which I'm really, really excited about. And I'm, I'm really loving the opportunity to share some of the knowledge I've gained through my work and just through my experience working with, you know, indigenous communities and um, with uh, aromatherapists and retailers, um, everybody kind of along the supply chain that are trying to make the right choices to help you know sustain our our field our therapy for generations to come yeah and you know there probably are some i guess some ethical issues that aromatherapists will have to ask themselves when they're practicing and i think that kind of leads us into our first my first question for you is what oils are we looking at that um i guess overlap between aromatherapy and endangered species that you do yeah. work with. Yeah, so, you know, um, we do bring attention to the various threatened and near threatened essential and carrier oil bearing plants through a list that the Institute that I started called Airman Institute. Um, we do bring this list uh, for free to people, um, you know, twice a year. 
Now, I haven't worked with every one of those plants that are listed on the list personally, but I have worked with many of them in the sense of being in the wild. Uh, I've worked with all the oils, I should say, or, or absolutes in some cases, but um, you know, they're unfortunately looking at just kind of the um, 400 or so, you know, commonly traded oils on the, on the world market right now, at least 10% of them are threatened or near threatened. And that, you know, encompasses agarwood and spikenard and atlas cedarwood and frankincense and rosewood and sandalwood and Taiwan cypress and, you know, sweet myrrh and elemi and, and um, uh, apricot, believe it or not. Um, so there's quite a few different ones that we're looking at on a global scale. And there's also ones that are uh, focused more on a regional level. And, and that's something that we try to bring awareness to. I think that that's one of the most important things when we're thinking about making ethical choices. You use the word, you know, ethical, you know, it's all about the way we practice, the decisions we make. We must, you know, first and foremost, I think, um, take care of the plants that are, you know, allowing us to engage in this role. We have to help heal and protect them. So um, the first, I think, you know, order is just to get familiar with those plants that are in fact threatened or near threatened, because that in itself is one way that we can better equip um, our, you know, kind of tool belt when it comes to sourcing these oils. I just, I'm curious, is your first training or experience within aromatherapy or does it come within the um, environmental community? Well, my experience uh, was initially in biology, uh, biologist, conservation biology. Um, and then as I was training and going through my doctoral program, I in fact um, started the, the aromatherapy certification program <laughs> because a lot of the work that I did in the lab um, at the time, I was doing some field work as well though, um, coincided very much with the essential oil constituents that are used in chemical communication um, via various species all over the world, you know, all over the globe basically. So they went hand in hand and I've always had a real love for aromatherapy and essential oil. So uh, I've always worked uh, with, uh, you know, from a bi biological perspective, but then also conservation, having worked with various endangered species, not just uh, essential oil bearing plants, but also uh, some primates as well. And learning about chemical communication, believe it or not, that's all been kind of the common thread to all of this, comes down to aromatics. So, I mean, that's just a general kind of background, how they tie together. Um, and in many ways, they, they've evolved together and they've grown together. So I think it's a really you know, happy marriage really between the two. In, in my world. <laughs> I, and, you know, I do, I think it makes a lot of sense that how somebody who is interested in conservation biology would find their way to aromatherapy. And I think a lot of people maybe miss or could overlook some of the overlap, but I think aromatherapy has such an uh, an appreciation for the nature of the plant within mm. the oil. We look so much more deeply at every plant. And so of course, like there would be consideration in you know, sustainability and like the, the actual ability to harvest the plant itself. And I guess that brings me to your work with particularly the rosewood and why that mm -hmm. is just so important to the preservation of a species like this. Yeah, you know, um, the thing is, is you mentioned, you know, just having that connection with these beautiful plants and, and having a background in biology and in conservation, you realize that you know, that plant is in fact connected to so many, many different species, you know, thousands of different species, if you're thinking about one community. So for example, you mentioned rosewood, if you're working with rosewood in, in, um, in the Amazon jungle, within that, you know, kind of very small space around that rosewood tree, it is in fact, when you're thinking about preserving that tree and how you're harvesting that particular species, you are in fact thinking about the, all the biodiversity, which is something that we, I think, have to be more mindful about when we're thinking about sustainability and conservation of essential oil bearing plants. It's really thinking about protecting biodiversity. Biodiversity is the key. 
And uh, rosewood, I feel, is in many ways what I would call a flagship species. So, you know, the more people that are in love with rosewood um, are maybe going to be more likely to protect it. But by doing so, um, you're protecting many, many other species as well. And rosewood, unfortunately, is uh, an endangered species. And it is because um, basically it's all down to unsustainable harvesting of its sapwood and its heart, its heart, the heartwood, which is basically used for the essential oil. Um, so what was happening and what's still happening um, to a certain degree are that trees of all sizes and ages are being harvested indiscriminately. Uh, and, and entire trees and even their roots are being destroyed. And so what's happening is illegal and unsustainable harvesting, as well as illegal logging and even distillation are taking place in really remote locations in the Amazon jungle, which I've actually stumbled upon. And it's really disheartening. It's really frightening. It's really sad to see this. Um, and uh, what's going on is when these things are happening with these beautiful trees, there's little, little signs, if any sign of regeneration. So this is a huge problem. And this is why we are dealing with uh, an issue with rosewood. So not only is it in danger, but it's also trade protected by CITES, uh, the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. Any country that is exporting, you know, rosewood oil needs to have a CITES permit, and this is something that uh, often is done illegally and without a permit. So, um, this is one of the many reasons that we find that this particular oil is heavily adulterated. Um, it's typically blended with, you know, either synthetic linalool. As a matter of fact, a lot of the rosewood oil that's coming into the United States is adulterated with synthetic linalool and it's referred to as the American quality product, which you know, is really uh, disheartening. And it could also be uh, adulterated with just with other species of amoeba oil um, or even whole leaf chemotype linalool essential oil or even you know, leaf and branch oil from the same species, but it's not the heartwood. So, this is where having a very good understanding of the oil and the uh, plant part when you're, heart, when you're sourcing, it's super, super important in making those decisions. Um, and of course, looking at the quality of the essential oil, you know, now that we have a very good understanding that a lot of the uh, rosewood oil is coming in probably illegally and also a very good portion of it very well could be um, adulterated you know, Airman Institute is looking at this very closely in collaboration with Laboratory Phytochemia, who are going to now be conducting a study on the adulteration of rosewood oil. That's really interesting to know that, um, you know, that there's a market for adulterated rosewood, knowing that it's already rare and that it's already just very valuable to knowing that there is a market to sell it but um it's i guess what what would you say a solution to this would be in the aromatherapy community since like there is a responsibility for aromatherapists for sustainable sourcing beside like how where else could they go to look for it and how yeah. how do they ensure that that type of integrity yeah well, you know, a lot of this is uh, speculation at this point. I mean, the hypothesis, I guess you can say, is that, that the majority of a rosewood oil on the market is adulterated um, to a certain degree, given those factors I touched on. Uh, but a lot of it comes down to asking the right questions and, and learning about, you know, what oil that you're, are you looking for rosewood oil from the leaves and branches or are you looking for it from the heartwood and to really recognize the difference between those two it comes down to chemical analysis um, and that's where it's very important to look closely at the um, the quality of the oil and understanding its chemistry and the different enantiomers um, of linalool um, as they do vary depending on whether it is heartwood, whether it is coming from the branches and or the leaves. And so it's this kind of uh, fairly detailed knowledge that kind of empowers one to make those decisions that are going to push back 
and in doing so, help to um, ensure more of a, a pure and sustainable supply in the future. So it's, it's looking at chemical analysis, quality control, and also CITES um, to actually have proof of a CITES permit from the end of the exporter and by the way, the end of the importer, anybody importing uh, CITES protected essential oil also needs that permit. By having CITES there, that in many ways directly implies that there is a sustainable source being um, distilled to bring this oil to you. CITES regulations vary throughout the globe. Each country has their own regulations, but just knowing what Peru and Brazil have uh, lined up, you have to meet very, very specific criteria that do fall within various pillars of sustainable management, whether it be environmental, economical, social, cultural, those things must be addressed before you will be even given a CITES permit. So I think having the CITES permit is one way to help ensure that you're getting a more quality and sustainably, you know, sustainably managed uh, essential oil. And, um, you know, the chemical analysis is very, very important because you are dealing with chirality in, in this particular species. And this is, you know, these for all these reasons, this is why we tend to have more adulteration. Linalol, synthetic linalol is so very cheap. It's much easier for maybe suppliers to, you know, just add the synthetic linalol. You can't tell the difference in terms of the overall fragrance profile oftentimes between synthetic linalol and pure uh, rosewood oil, because what you're really smelling for the most part in rosewood oil is linalol. And um, so there's various uh, things that you have to keep in mind. And this is why when it comes to ethical sourcing, it's, it can be very complicated. It's never as easy as it's just the word, you know, I'm just gonna say this or ask this, or, you know, maybe this particular website says, oh, it's sustainable, therefore it is. Sometimes it can take a lot more digging to get that information. Frankincense is another really good example of, you know, you have all these different species on the, on the world market right now, at least seven. They're being harvested differently um, in certain cases. There's different communities to think about, the local harvesters and uh, also quality and adulteration. There are many facets to thinking about, you know, making ethical decisions. And it really does come back down to the individuals on the ground working with these plants and those indigenous communities for example, with rosewood, we're working with the Shipibo communities, and this tree is very, very important to them, not just through, you know, um, as a source of medicine, but really uh, it's a spiritual connection. It's a cultural connection. It's preservation of their culture, basically part of preserving rosewood. And this is so very important. I think we oftentimes forget who is behind the bottle what goes and who goes into this bottle. It's, it's really, really stepping back and thinking about that. And that's what we don't see. And those are the stories we don't hear. Uh, and so I think it's important to celebrate those particular communities, local and indigenous that are connected to these plants in ways that, that we're learning about in ways that we need to help preserve. When we had been talking earlier, we had spoken about plant conservation genetics. Can you tell me more about that topic and what you're learning there? Okay, so plant you know, conservation genetics, when we think about just genetics, it's really just looking at a branch of biology. We're looking at the study of genes and we're looking again, mostly at genetic variation and biodiversity and protecting biodiversity. One of the main things in doing that is is basically protecting genetic um, variety and genetic diversity. So when it comes down to plant conservation genetics, it's really all about understanding kind of the dynamics of genes and in these plant populations and, and how they are responding to the environment. Um, it could be, you know, in terms of taking these different methods of genetics and applying it to their conservation and basically the restoration of biodiversity. That's it in a nutshell. But there's many ways that plant conservation genetics is, 
really fundamentally important for protecting these species down the road. And, and by, by protecting them, of course, that goes right back to the indigenous communities. Um, and of course, future generations of people that want to use these essential oils. But if we're thinking about, you know, what is the importance of plant conservation genetics, it comes down to, as I mentioned, genetic diversity, which really is significant for conservation pro programs. You know, a lack, with, a lack of genetic diversity limits a plant's adaptation capabilities. And this is actually a huge problem when we're thinking about the effects and impacts of climate change. Uh, that is something that in fact, conservation genetics has a very important role in when we're thinking about uh, climate change on plants. And also conservation genetics in this regard helps us identify the correct species you know, a lot of times without identifying the correct species, we have trouble with um, conducting the correct research we need to or identifying species that may in fact not be endangered versus ones that are. Uh, this is really, really important. It also helps protect these plants from being illegally traded. Um, and also conservation genetics in this respect um, helps like in terms of helps us look at more of the impact of, of wild harvested species that have been overexploited. We can better determine how this impacts those species and how they're responding to their environment in this respect. Also, unfortunately, you know, we're losing probably close to at least they predict a million species right now in 2019. At least a million species are basically in faced with extinction. And one of the main reasons is habitat destruction and, and fragmentation. And unfortunately, plants are, are the ones that are heavily impacted by this. And we need conservation genetics in order to understand how habitat destruction and say how habitat fragmentation are impacting these plant survival. And you know, conservation genetics is also important for plant breeding um, this is massively important when we're thinking about seed banks and field gene banks and preserving genetic material, what that looks like. You know, it's kind of a combination of using genetics in the field and in the lab to help ensure um, a future of these plants and hopefully help not just with sustainability, but also conservation, protecting them now. Um, you know, that also can be something that's looked at along the supply chain. And, you know, there's barcoding that's, that's occurring where, you know, we can actually identify plants right off the bat that are threatened. And just with DNA analysis and, and fairly quick analysis, we can tell if that is in fact the endangered species or not. And that could uh, help protect it from being um, exported under, you know, illegal methods. And uh, so, you know, the conservation genetics is really, really... Uh, it hits a lot of things. I mean... Yeah, I, I'm going so on and on ground. and on. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. And, but, you know, it really, and this is something I talk about for the, the Naha conference is that it is in many ways, it has been going on, but it is in many ways the future of sustainability uh, in terms of conservation because a lot of it has to do with the impact of climate change. This is really where conservation genetics hits home. And we are going to see it more in the supply chain as well, which traceability is absolutely um, huge and conservation genetics does play a, a role in that as well. So there's many different ways to, to look at this. And I think that this is something that we need to be thinking more about in terms of you know, ethical sourcing and what that means. So I'm curious, is something, something that's getting into this type of research, is it being funded by anybody? Is there anybody in support of it? And what does that look like? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of great research being done right now on agarwood, for example, a lot of academic research. Um, and there's even research being done through private organizations as well. Um, I recently stumbled upon, I'm actually giving a talk on this, on dragon's blood, croton lecher, lecheleri, 
Um, and it's amazing what the, the work that's being done to look at the genetics of various species of proton um, because the trade is very difficult in identifying which species is what. And so it is putting more of a um, demand and is causing more of an impact on maybe species that would otherwise not have this particular issue. Yeah, academic, there's a lot of um, research being done on frankincense and, and sandalwood, and a lot of it's funded through various grants, private organizations. There is funding out there, and it's definitely, I think, going to be much more easily funded down the road, especially as climate change tends to fuel a lot of this research to begin with. And just because, I mean, I think your work is so interesting. It, it blends together like two very strongly correlated things. And it really, I think a lot of people might find an interest in, in pursuing something like this. How would you say so, somebody who wants to study plants on both of these levels um, find their way into conservation research or conservation genetics in general? Um, well, I would say, you know, reach out to any of the research that are working on these various projects. Uh, we are actually, Airmid Institute is looking closely at a species called Munya, and we are collaborating with the university in Peru on looking at the genetics of the actual species in terms of authentication, because um, there's been a lot of misidentification, and this is not very good for uh, conservation efforts for this particular plant, which I should mention isn't in danger of being extinct. Um, as a matter of fact, it's quite abundant at this point, but if something doesn't change and we keep up this level of misidentification and, and actually couple with some real problems with unsustainable harvesting, there will be a problem in as little as, as 50 years. And so a lot of these measures being put into place now are more, you know, preventative, looking toward the future and finding ways to sort this out now. So I would encourage somebody to reach out to the researchers, um, help collect plant material, help uh, with fundraising, help bring awareness to the, the work or the plant and the project in general. There's a lot of ways that somebody can get involved. It sometimes maybe not always is in the field, but uh, behind the scenes as well. Um, you know, collecting samples for herbariums, um, all kinds of different things can be done. And this is all work that needs to be done. It's, um, it takes a village really. Yeah. And you're also doing um, another study with Airmed Institute. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, the, um, I touched on it just briefly uh, earlier, just uh, thinking about rosewood oil. So Airmed Institute, um, is collaborating with Laboratory Phytochemia yeah. to, yeah. yeah, yeah. And what we're hoping to get um, is uh, samples of rosewood oil. And uh, anybody that submits these samples that are used in the study will end up getting a GC uh, MS report for their sample. And there will be a, an official announcement going out relatively soon. I would imagine hopefully around the time that the conference um, is live and um, we'll have more information. And of course, anybody's welcome to email me to get more details about the study now if they wanna get involved right now. Yes, and we will, we will be happy to make sure Naha shares that as well, just because I think that would be great research to help support. So thank, thank you for you. that. Thank you, yeah. thanks Savannah. That is uh, currently we're under the process of submitted uh, applications for funding for phase four. And um, we're very excited about that. Unfortunately, COVID has put a bit of a halt on the project simply because we haven't been able to travel freely and to do the work on the ground. So having this rosewood oil study, in fact, is one way that we can continue to bring awareness around rosewood oil and to um, continue the work, but from behind the scenes, I, I guess that's one way to put it. Uh, we're also working with the Shipibo on bringing a project to light on Piri Piri, which is not a threatened species, but it is a, a wonderful aromatic that's used a lot in the perfume industry. And uh, we're looking at helping preserve their uh, more of a, it's more about cultural sustainability here because Piri Piri is something very, very important to the Shipibo community. 
And we are working on a wonderful paper, maybe turning that into a book on sharing what this particular plan is for this community and how that relates to their culture in terms of ceremony and spirit and medicine. And it has done for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, we're also, um, again, that's our project on White Sage has been put on hold simply because of COVID, but uh, we're hoping that very much this year, we're going to be going to California and looking at doing an assessment on population numbers, um, not only with the White Sage, but I should say that rosewood oil is, or sorry, rosewood trees as well in Peru and in Brazil. Um, so that's some work going on there. We have some wonderful stuff going on with the potential junior ambassador program where we're going to be implementing children's programs um, for ages five to 11, children working with medicinal plants uh, locally and learning all about the different attributes of those plants and the history of those plants and interactive uh, programs. So we have quite a bit of other things going on too, but those are just some, some of the highlights. Uh, again, all focused on protecting the biodiversity and um, just bringing awareness. Of course, Aramid has webinars where we are trying to bring in different aspects of um, these uses of essential oils and extracts and hydrosols in our community, not just with plants, but also with animals. Uh, we're gonna be featuring Dan Regler, who is working on a wonderful project to help protect um, a more humane way of, of working with civets, where of course the civet paste is used as a, as a fixative in perfumes and also for its, its, its fragrance. And so, um, you know, we're just thinking more on a, a holistic level when it comes to how we are protecting these aromatic species and um, animals also. I think it's in some ways the, the complete package to the aspects of aromatherapy that a lot of people find themselves pulled to it. Think about it's, it's all the integrity of the plant and the species and the respect for um, these natural things that we get that are, that are healing and helpful and soothing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really, I love what you do, Kelly, and I'm so glad you were you came in and were able to share and that we'll be hearing more from you at the conference. And not only that, we have We've had past discussions or you've had for Naha webinars that talk about some of your topics too. And I'll make sure to include um, kind of all of your past work that you've shared with us in this capacity in the links below um, wherever you're listening this podcast on. Well, thank you so much, Savannah. I've really enjoyed my time here today. And thanks for giving me a platform to share a little bit about um, Aramid and the work that we're doing and to put a call out to get support, um, hopefully some rosewood oil samples. Uh, people can email us and we can get this study going. We're very excited about it and looking forward to sharing uh, the results with everyone. So thank you. Awesome. And we'll put the links to your website below as well um, and anything else that people can find you on. So thanks everybody for listening to the podcast today and we'll catch you next time on the Beyond Aromatics podcast. <laughs>